as uh, Christa and UNESCO pointed out, uh, she, they, they underlined the importance of a broader cooperation between organizations and states. And uh, one can see this conference a respond to this. And as our Minister for Culture also pointed out, uh, one can also see this is a, an important step for a closer collaboration in these questions between the Nordic and Baltic countries. With the formalities done, we now turn to uh, our attention to the program at hand. And uh, I would like to present to you the next speaker. She's a journalist and a documentary filmer, among other things. She has made the documentary series Kultur i Forosonen, Culture in the Danger Zone, where she uh, meets people that live under threat and even risk their life to save their culture. In 2020, she was awarded the Swedish UNESCO Prize for her efforts in the matter. Please give a warm welcome to Shazar Fatemi. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It's an honor to be here, but I would also like to thank you all for being here, taking time to participate in this important conference. My hopes are that you leave with a type of knowledge, because I know you have a lot of knowledge, but a type of knowledge that will create courage and determination that would lead to action. You know, words are good to have, but I think we need action right now. I would like to share a little bit about my personal experience when it comes to cultural heritage, but also, of course, my professional experience as a journalist. And for me, I see cultural heritage as our inner light. That is where you find your resilience. The resilience you need to stand strong in difficult moments. I think it's also why it becomes such a powerful weapon in war and violent conflicts. Because with cultural heritage, what comes with it, it's strength, representation, self-confidence, belonging, and safety, security in a group. It is central to our collective memory. And through cultural heritage, that's how we are able to keep that memory alive. So let me take you on a journey. And it starts with a song that I usually sing in a dark room with my child next to me, but I would like to share it with you. If Ministry of Culture was here right now, I think she could have recognized it. It's a Persian song, a Farsi song. And this is a song my father, especially my mother, used to sing to me when I was a child. Last night, I sang it when I put my daughter to bed. When she gets a little bit older, not only will she hear a beautiful melody, but she will also be reminded that the same melody once saved her family's life. I had just turned one when my parents decided to flee Iran. As Kurds and political activists, they had spent eight years of their life living underground away from the Iranian regime. Every now and then they changed hiding place and what became my safety and my home was my parents' embrace. But now it was time to leave the country. It was a matter of life and death. And we could not imagine that after almost 40 years we would still not be able to return. Mom and dad were also responsible for two other children who they were supposed to take across the border to Azerbaijan. The car had stopped, dropped us off, 
and now we start walking. Dad had told me that the families who have been discovered in that valley, that many of them have lost their lives when the border police discovered them. My parents knew that well. And so did the 11-year-old boy who was with us that night. Dad told me it was pitch black and the only sound they could hear was their footsteps and the sound of crickets. While they are walking, suddenly the boy stops. He can't move. The fear in him has turned into shock. My father is carrying the other child, a girl about my age, and my mom is carrying me. It doesn't matter what he whispers to him, trying to convince him to move, keep going. It doesn't matter how much he pulls or drags him. The boy cannot move. The fear in him has paralyzed him. They've told me that the other girl and I had become anxious. Until then, they were managed to calm us down with pistachios. So I have a special relation to pistachios also. But that doesn't help either. If we start to cry, the border police will discover us. And that's when my mom starts to whisper the song. پاییز آمد در میان درختان لانه کرده کبوتر در تراوش باران می گریزد خرشید از هم با تمام غرورش پشت عبر سیاهی آشغانه به گریه می نشیند With this melody and familiar words about trees sunset, field of flowers and doves come a sense of belonging and safety. We little ones get calm and quiet. The boy gets the courage to open his eyes, to move, take those life-saving steps. And my parents, they get the hope and strength, they told me, they needed that night. To continue, it take us across the border to safety. To this day, I find myself humming that song when I'm in difficult moments. To be honest, when I sing it for my girl, I also sing it for myself. I sing it for my dad as a thank you, now when he's no longer with us. That is what cultural heritage means to me. This time, dressed in a lullaby. So that's my personal reflection on cultural heritage, the role it can have in our lives. In the 18 years that I've been working as a journalist and documentary filmmaker, I've had the privilege to experience cultural heritage in many of its incredible and beautiful shapes and forms. But I can say that I would have never understood its value without the people behind it who could tell me about the culture. Their knowledge has been the key for me to understand the core value of our common cultural heritage. And never have I felt that the cultural heritage I'm carrying has weakened because I open up and give space to other kind of cultural heritage. On the contrary, it has strengthened my own, enriched my own, and made me feel safer. And you know the feeling of safety? It becomes because almost every time I've noticed that we have so much in common that I knew. Many of the people I met while producing the documentary series for Swedish television, Culture in Danger Zone. They described their culture or our common culture heritage as something that meant everything to them. That's why they were trying to save it. It's our history, it's our present, and it's our future, they told me. 
And it could be a place, it could be a monument, it could be a dialect. For my family, it's been our name because we didn't have the right to have Kurdish names. So keeping that name was our way of saving our cultural heritage. But where it all came to something it is that all these cultural heritage in different shapes and forms were connected to some kind of memory. And that memory was carrying the people's identity. So despite the shape and form the cultural heritage expressed itself through, it was often the connection to the identity I met of these people, heroes I call them, to stand up and protect it. And perhaps that is why dictatorships and extremists, among others, systematically are trying to destroy, burn, ban, minimize, deny specific cultures. They are trying to get to the identity of the people they reject. And they do that by silencing and killing the memory of the cultural heritage, because that is the people's resilience. Videos that few of us have missed is how ISIS is smashing thousand-year-old statues in Mosul in Iraq and the World Heritage Site of Palmyra, Syria. The same group, they loot, steal, and sell the culture they reject on the legal market to be able to finance their terrorist activities. And when ISIS destroyed these activities, the world condemned everyone in this room. We condemned that act. And I remember being in Syria, going to Palmyra with the director of National Museum of Damascus, Dr. Mamoun, an amazing person. I remember he told me, you know what, Hazar? We condemn what ISIS is doing, but we should also condemn when people and groups in suits are trying to silence cultural heritage down prioritize cultural heritage. He said, because the result are just as devastating for humanity. So when an artifact is taken from its people, the memory and the story usually goes with it. Whether it's destroyed or sold on the illegal market. But the same happens when you are not using your cultural heritage. It's like silencing a language or a song. You forget it and it ceases to exist. So we must do everything we can to prevent event this from happening. P because if we take it for granted, not investing in keeping the history, memory, and interest of the cultural heritage alive, we will eventually be responsible for its fading. And the cultural resilience we need in critical times will be fading with it. Um, when we left Iran, um, we didn't come to Sweden immediately. We stopped in Afghanistan for seven years and I grew up there as a refugee. And as a journalist, I went back from 2008 every year to report about what was going, in, going on in the country, and one of the favorite places I went to, for my own sake, was the National Museum. Outside the museum in Kabul was a stone, and I don't know if it's still there, but it had the inscription, a, na a, nation, is st stays, a nation stays alive when its culture stays alive. So, I would like to introduce you to some of the people I've met during my years as a reporter and a journalist who really inspired me to understand the value of cultural heritage. And we will start in Afghanistan. Abdullah Ibrahimi was working at the Kabul Histori History Museum when the Taliban took over Afghanistan last time. Along with four of his colleagues, they risked their lives by moving priceless artifacts at night to a secret location, a place they decided to tell the world about 14 years later. Abdullah Ibrahimi was work, 
uh, the Haidara family in Timbuktu, Mali, live in incredibly poor conditions. They could easily and quickly become rich and move elsewhere as long as they sell family's heritage, the thousand-year-old manuscripts. But the father told us that no money in the world would replace an enormous cultural wealth and pride that the scriptures bring, that if he sells the heritage, the only thing his family will be is poor. Mari Haddad, a mother who lost one of her children, a four-year-old son, in the Syrian war. She's also a singer and lives in the Christian town of Malula, Syria, one of the few places in the world where people still speak the language Jesus is said to have spoken. Staying there and keeping the language alive, especially through music and passing it on to the next generation, gives her hope and drives her forward. The Yazidis, one of the most prosecuted people in the world. I don't know where to begin. During ISIS, I reported on horrific testimonies. Is it possible for a Yazidi to rise up and come back? I asked myself. The answer was yes. They found hope in their religion and the strength in their culture. In Mostar, Bosnia, where the bomb stopped falling 25 years ago, a silent war has continued and divisions between communities remain. The musician and teacher Orhan Maslo has used music as a weapon to lift up the city's inhabitants and show them what they have in common. The successful music school has united many of the city's young people who he believes are the future of the country. and the Lakota people, the indigenous people of the United States, who with their incredible love of nature, so closely linked to their culture and identity, have managed to stop the big com oil companies from fracking in their territory. I want to make it better for my kids, so, so they know their ways, so it's easier to live. Because if we lose our, our our culture, if we lose our language, we lose we lose everything. Then our identity's gone. The six bulldozers are pulling back right now. People are marching forward in their tracks. There are men, women, and children. This land belongs to the earth. We are only caretakers. We're caretakers of the earth. I remember when I was sitting there watching the powwow, um, I started to cry. Because the rhythm from the drums, the feeling, the vibration I could feel in my body reminded me of when I dance Kurdish with my family, the same type of vibration. And we use the dance for the same reason, for a wedding, to get together. But I don't know, my parents danced before they went to war because they found this incredible gift that cultural heritage brings with it. This time, dressed in a dance. So these heroes, they have inspired me to inspire others to work even harder to make those around us realize how unique and precious our common cultural heritage is and how much it depends on us to care for it and protect it because it will be there when we need it but we need to be there when it needs us. I really believe that for culture to survive we need to cherish it, and we do that by using it. When you use something, that's when you can feel it. And when you can feel it, that's when you can understand it. I really believe that. And I was listening to the Ministry of Culture, and I'm glad that we put cultural heritage on the list. But we also need to invest on the list. We need to invest in it because that's when it grows. Maybe that's what it takes for it to survive. And that's how we can protect it. 
Many of these heroes I mentioned told me, don't wait. Then it could have been too late. So, many of the cultural heritage I have mentioned, they are also considered, considered as world heritage. The year my family crossed the border and fled to safety, 1985, Sweden signed the World Heritage Convention. In Article 27 it says, the state's parties to, to this convention shall endeavor by all appropriate means, and in particular by educational and information programs, to strengthen appreciation and respect by their people of the culture and natural heritage. So, are we doing that? If not, can we then say that we are still committed? I don't have the answers. But for sure, the amazing people who directly work with our common cultural heritage, they do. So we need to listen to them. We need to talk to them and then act. That's when we can say, yes, we are still committed. So tonight, I will probably sing the lullaby to my daughter as she goes to sleep. I will tell her from time to time how it saved us as an example of what role culture can have in our life. With that, I hope she feels privileged, that she feels pride and responsibility to cherish it. And by using it, she will keep that inner light burning so she can pass it to the next generation to come. Thank you. Thank you for this very personal reflections and sharing it with us. Um, you touched upon, or you said that silencing the language of cultural heritage is devastating. And uh, I would like you to develop what happens to a culture or a cultural heritage when you do not use it, when you do not mention it, and when you do not have any memories. Why is the use of culture so important? And this is an interesting. I mean, I've been working with cultural heritage so many years, and I still have difficulties to find the words because it's so important. So I'm trying to see what can I say that really can explain the importance of cultural heritage. And I think that is my answer. Uh, it's everything. I think it, it, it comes when you need it. And it, it, it's so different shapes and forms. Um, I mean, for me, it was dressed in a lullaby, but I know for many people, for my mother, it's, it's, a, it's a key to a building in, back in Kurdistan. The house is no longer there, but the key still is carrying the story of a life, of a history, of a background, of generations. So for her, she would die for me, but she will never lean, loan me the key. That's how important it is for her. Um, so I think for her, her telling me the story about her life, mentioning it, that is a way of using her knowledge, her memories, in keeping the culture, heritage, um, alive, or life. Mm. Um, so that's what I thought about when you asked the question, yeah. Yeah. This key. Thank you. Uh, I, I read an interview with the, another Swedish documentary filmmaker, Sara Brus, just the other day, and she said, memories, they can, can be like physical traces in your body, and when you, you sang the lullaby, I was thinking, can you relate to that? Like yeah, no, no, absolutely, uh, absolutely, because, I mean, I don't think, the, I was two year old, um, I didn't think about the words or the meaning, I didn't have a connection to the song then, 
what it meant to my parents. But I know it was connected to a person that I trust, that I, it's my mother. And through that, I mean, during this night or even now, and I mean, it, it's like it, something happens within you when there are feelings and memories connected. And I believe that's what happened to this boy. I mean, she, she sings a song and he opens his eyes. He finds the courage through a connection to this song. So I absolutely be believe that it's, it's connected to our m muscle memory mm -hmm. of how to feel when you're experiencing something. Mm -hmm. For me to hear that lullaby, my muscle memory was to be calm, to feel safe. And uh, absolutely, it could be the opposite. You can hear stuff, see stuff that give you the opposite feeling. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Please give an applause for Shasar Katami. Thank you. Thank you.